SWA is a landscape architect planning and urban design firm with eight offices nationally and internationally. Jeffrey Carbo Landscape Architects is a landscape architecture and design firm located out of Alexandria and Baton Rouge. I'm now going to hand it over to Kinder Baumgartner, principal at SWA Houston, and Jeffrey Carbo, principal at JCLA, to present their team and their proposal. Please join me in welcoming them to Baton Rouge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, there it is today, the brain drain, front page of the newspaper, right? Everybody's leaving Baton Rouge. Is it because of the lakes? Maybe, I don't know. But in all seriousness, we can help you with this, and I'm gonna talk about this in a minute. Um, this is a real deal that happens to cities across the country. I live in Houston, Texas. Uh, everybody has lots of jokes they like to make about Houston, Texas. We'll make some in a minute. Uh, but anyway, we're here to talk about the lakes, and I think that's the most important thing we wanna talk about is this project. Uh, you're going to see a couple of case studies that we have done, some projects work that we've done. Uh, hopefully, the main thing that you'll be left with today is you'll understand a little bit about how we think about a project. You'll understand a little bit about how we engage with the public uh, and our client groups uh, through the ideas and kind of the techniques that we do as we go about studying a place. Uh, but I want to talk, uh, introduce uh, Jeff. Uh, he's a landscape architect uh, here at Baton Rouge and uh, an office in Alexandria. One thing uh, I want to be sure that everyone realizes is that uh, technically a person from Alexandria is not a Yankee, uh, but a person from Monroe is. So just uh, <laughs> clarify that. Uh, I grew up in Louisiana. I grew up in uh, Baton Rouge, and I now live about four hours away in, uh, in Houston. This is a huge opportunity for me and my firm uh, to come here and actually be a part of this. In the 1980s, when I was in college, we watched them dredge the lake the first time. I was a landscape architecture student. I was intensely excited about it. Um, and you know, here we are back again trying to do it again. We need to get it right this time, I think. Jeff, do you want to talk a little bit about just sort of your? Well, for us, it's a tremendous opportunity. And in lots of ways, it reminds me of in school, these types of projects are always hypotheticals. And we're really talking about doing something that can be transformative. And for us, it's a lifetime opportunity. And I can't tell you how much we appreciate being here today. We're excited about the potential, and, and we look forward to the potential of working with all of you guys. Um, and with that, yeah, let's, let's, let's get into it. Okay, so the lakes, right? Is this thing going to work? Yes, nature, right? It's a lot about nature. But everything we do here uh, is also about, maybe I have to double click it, is also about culture. Uh, and the way that we sort of view this project is that if we go about thinking about the lakes, that if we do something to nature, uh, maybe it gets paired with something that's cultural or social, right? We don't want to just do social, cultural things without thinking about the nature of the place. So water, right? That's what this project is all about. That's what South Louisiana is about. And, but what we do in South Louisiana, we don't just kind of, you know, look at water. We bend it. We make it do the things we want to do, right? So the Mississippi River, it's not really a river. It's a transportation corridor. The Atchafalaya Basin, it's not really nature. I mean, there's a lot of nature there, but it's, it's a giant flood control project, really. And that's, that's the history of us, that, that of Louisiana. We've always done those sort of things. So, you know, the key to this project, it's water, right? Baton Rouge is here because of water. And, you know, water is the heart of Louisiana. I think we can't forget about that history. And that's a little bit of thinking about history and thinking about the state. It needs to be embedded into the fabric of this project. So when I go and I look at this place, you know, it's much like it was when I was a kid. Uh, it hasn't changed all that much. And I look at it and it's like, why are we even here, right? What, this place is perfect. It's beautiful. Why mess with it? Let's don't screw it up. It would be really easy to screw it up. It would be extremely easy to come in and do a bunch of crazy things and make a mess. But I think what we're also learning is it'd be easy to screw it up by not doing enough, right? Because there's things that are already happening here that are a bit of a problem. So very robust, but there's a lot of problems, right? Fish kills. Crazy things that people do with their cars as they drive along the edges, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, yikes. And that's, you know, that happens multiple times a year, I understand. So it hasn't changed much since I was a kid. Uh, so this is a uh, picture of probably in the 40s, right? And then here we are again today. Again, very similar kind of place. Everything has sort of stayed the same. Not everything. I'm not sure if that's Bujo or Thibodeau, but this is an actual picture on the lakes. I don't know how this guy's going to do that, but... This is for real. Uh, so, but you know, we think about the history of the place, right? This place was carved out of this great swamp. 
it's to make way for probably development partly, but also it was just like in, the, in those days, nature in the city, that was a bad idea, right? Well, we've changed our thinking now. Nature in the city is a good thing. So what we want to do is we see these lakes slowly going back to what they once were. I think we need to ask the lakes and the people what do they want to be, because I think that's, that's really the question at hand. If we just, if we don't guide the lakes towards what we want them to be, they'll just become their own thing. But if we try too hard, I think that the balance never gets done completely right. So a, a big point of view for us is the idea of healthy cities and what that means. Uh, if I kind of go through the RFP, right, the request for proposal that we get, there's very pragmatic concerns that are asked to deal with. Water quality, check. All this excavation, check. Uh, pedestrian vehicular conflicts, how do we deal with that? Wayfinding and gateways, right? But that's not really the things that we're interested in. That's not really the problem. The problem is, what is the state of Louisiana and how does it fit into the mindset, sort of the national mindset uh, of people across the country or around the world? So there we are, you know, in Louisiana. There we are in the United States. And there we go. Uh, so we need to think about what is a healthy city, right? So healthy cities, they really deal with these sort of four things, personal health, ecological health, they deal with social health and economic health, right? And when cities start to embrace those kind of things and they do it through their landscapes, a lot of things change. People become healthier. We actually find creative class people want to move there. That kind of changes that brain drain thing, right? Uh, people are actually more wealthy, we find, in communities that have embraced these kinds of lifestyles and these types of uh, opportunities. And, you know, I live in Houston, right? And so I, I can talk about this with a, a smile on my face. When people think about Louisiana, they think about our food, and they think about our culture, but they also think about words like cancer alley, they think about words like uh, BP oil spill, right? Uh, I live in Houston, you think about freeways, you think about sprawl, occasionally you might think of the Galleria or something like that, right? So, you know, th those are, there's these negatives that are associated with these places. But landscapes and little projects like this, they really do make a difference. This is the cover of Metropolis Magazine, this is in Houston, Texas place that everybody used to make fun of. Now it's on the cover of magazines talking about healthy living, right? The brand of Houston has changed. New York Times, top 46 places to go in 2013. Houston's number seven. Paris, France was number 47. Uh, I don't know where they got this, but this is what they're telling me, okay? It's like on Steve, the Forbes magazine, you know, coolest places in the country. Uh, and it's because of a project that we did that changed everyone's mindset that lives in Houston then the people that come to visit it, and then the people that read about it, and then they wanna go and they visit. And then we're gonna show you that project in a moment. Uh, so how do we work? Collaboration is a huge thing for us. Uh, Jeff and I are gonna collaborate intensely on a project like this. I have partners in seven offices across the US. We collaborate constantly. When there's a problem that I can't solve, I get on the phone, I call those guys, they help me out, and vice versa. So, come on, here we go. All right, uh, so we have this great team that we've set up, so it's, uh, Jeff's firm, of course, and my firm. Uh, but we have engineers, Stantec, they're here uh, in, in Baton Rouge. Sherwood, they're, they're sort of a green engineering firm. Uh, they deal with things about you know, ecology uh, and that, kinda, that type of thinking with civil engineering. Pros Consulting deals with the economics of parks, right? How do we put revenue in parks? How do we fund parks? Where do we go get the money? ETM, they deal with operations and maintenance. Uh, and biohabitats, these guys are actually experts at using dredge materials and figuring out what you can and can't do with it and how to create habitat out of that material. So when we get an RFP, this is the kind of thing that we normally get. Uh, or we su submit this very, all these little boxes, I'm gonna do this, this guy's gonna do that. Looks very simple and clean, right? Well, the reality of collaboration is actually, it's kind of like making sausage, it's, I guess, boudin. It's uh, more complicated. Uh, so the way we're gonna work here is that I, SWA project director, that's me, uh, Jeff Carbo, that's this guy right here. Uh, and then you guys, the client group, uh, John Spain or whoever his designation uh, or group is, uh, we're gonna work very collaboratively. We're the principals that are involved in this project. Uh, from there, we add then kind of these guys that are sitting up here, our project manager, our senior designers, our project landscape architects, they start to make things happen. Then we start to add all the other layers of the client group, stakeholders, the community, that's part of the client group, right? Uh, then we add our in-house specialists, our design teams, our public engagement specialists, and then we start to add all these specialty consultants, right? It's a mess. How could you ever do a project like this? Well, we do this every day. 
And it's collaboration, and that's what makes our projects, I think, some of the best projects that are being built uh, around the world today. So we start to put these little boxes around things that kind of helps it kind of get your mind around it. But because we do this, we really understand it. I don't know, Jeff, if you wanted to talk a bit about collaboration or... Well, I mean, we've used the word multiple times, but I think what's really important when you begin one of these projects, and I think it's a very healthy approach internally, and after we listen to you, there are no bad ideas. Everything gets put out on the table, and then we begin to distill. And I think it's that way that we come up with the best product. It's your project. We really want to listen to you guys, but internally I think it's all about throwing out anything that's possible or putting it out there on the table and then begin to distill ideas. And I think with your input, we will come together with a really special project. And I think that's the point that we really wanted to make here. And the other important client is the university, right? I mean, technically there's ownership, you know, they own these lakes. Uh, there's great resources that are locked away there. There's hydrologists, there's landscape architects, there's architects, there's uh, ornithologists. We're gonna tap into that network as a part of this project. We have to in order to make it a success. So the hallmark of my firm is planning work that is realized and built. And I think that's a huge distinction, at least that we like to tout uh, at SWA. Um, I have lots of illustrators that I can call on the phone. It's like, hey, I need this drawing done. Make it look like this. And they're great, and they draw these beautiful pictures for me. Uh, but the real hallmark, hallmark is then having it actually come out and be built the way that we envisioned it to be built. And that's what we do. So I'm going to show you a project. This is the one that kind of changed the face of downtown Houston and people's idea of Houston. It's called Buffalo Bayou Promenade. Uh, and it's Got a pointer. It's basically this stretch right here. We're going to talk about this stretch in a minute as well, but it's this piece right here, that, right along the edge of downtown. And so when we started, it looked like this. Abandoned, derelict, homeless place. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with it. It's basically just they move wastewater through there. Uh, what we said is, hey, this is landscape infrastructure. This is an opportunity to redefine our city. What are we going to do with this thing? So through a lot of hard work, through doing a master plan, and then doing a master plan that we then went out and helped get the funding for, and then actually going and implementing it through construction documents, working with contractors, being on the site constantly. Uh, in the end, it looks like this. And this is complicated. You're working with Harris County Flood Control. You're working with the Corps of Engineers. You're working with TxDOT by trying to build a park where they don't want one to be. And in the end, you end up with places that look like this. This is the new event center that is downtown Houston. Everybody comes here. If you're going to see the fireworks or see a music show, this is where it is. New bridges that are built, new urban connections no one ever thought about uh, that they would want to go jogging in this location, they do it now. And you know, if you turn your camera just to the right, big, tall, glass and steel buildings, nature right in the heart of the city, people bicycling, riding their bikes to work, people that never thought that they would do that in Houston. This stuff is contagious, and it starts to grow, and successes like that build successes like this, so this is the next step. Working with the contractor, figuring out how to dredge this project, where to take it, what to do with it to actually improve the thing. And so this is stage two, the next three miles. They said, we like this one so much, we're gonna fund the next three miles of this project, so it keeps going. Working with artists, these guys are not supposed to be on the site, we just poured concrete. They wanna be on this project so bad that they're showing up. Uh, contractors are telling them, please leave. Uh, <laughs> There's a, then that be created Houston's new reality, which is the uh, Bayou Greenways project. So basically this is Houston, the urban centers, our bayous, uh, Buffalo Bayou Promenade. We have uh, created the park that we just looked at, which has now created the Gr Bayou Greenways project. It's about 300 miles of urban connectivity along the bayous. This is being funded. We just passed a huge bond measure. People in Texas, hate taxes as much as people in Louisiana, and they voted to tax themselves to do this project uh, because they saw the success of the first one and the second one and now this one. Uh, it's a big deal, and it has changed our city dramatically. Places like this, people doing things like that. So what else do we have here? Bray's Bayou, this is just a different project that kind of gets into some of the issues. This is a different Bayou project. Uh, gets into some of the issues that you guys are having here. So big lakes. We needed to build a lake here. It's basically a detention basin. Ended up looking like this after we were done. Beautiful, all this nature. But what we, is important here, we moved a million cubic yards of dirt to do this. Your project has about 850,000 cubic yards, at least per the current report. We know how to do this stuff, and we do it well. Uh, Jeff's gonna talk about a project that he's done, actually in Texas too, uh, which I think is, fits very tightly with this. Uh, 
you got to kind of hit this thing twice. Okay. It's a little, a little clumsy. Gotcha. Well, first, let me tell you, you see the tagline, um, resilient process, resilient project. This is a town, um, Orange, Texas. It's three and a half hours west of us on I-10. It's a town of 18,000 people. What I tell often is that this is a, a, a project about a town that dared to dream big. And I think part of the common ground between um, Kinder and I is that we, we enjoy the journey. We love the process, but I really enjoy the destination. I want to see things built. And this was eight years of my professional career of, of helping them through a master plan and through actually building this project. But similarities, you probably know a lot about us. We want to talk more about your project, but we'll go through these very quickly. 252 acres in the middle of this town that was preserved. The town grew up around it. Um, a lot of sensitive issues, a bayou that was not really connected to the town, a pond that had been built 40 years ago that has now become a heronry. The program for this was kind of different, a nature center and a botanical garden. But what we did was try to integrate what we believe to be the key things, connecting people with nature with sensitively placed boardwalks running through uh, sensitive ha habitats, um, working with native vegetation, exploiting the bayou to the degree that people could be exposed to it and actually experience the bayou, uh, environmental education pavilions, um, creating new water bodies as destinations within the park. Um, every project, I don't care how planned, how well planned strategies always has some degree of, of adversity. And for us, it was Hurricane Rita. We broke ground. We were two weeks into construction when Rita hit. When the client called us up to come to Orange five days later, I thought it was, this project is over. Pack your bags and let's go. But it was very different. It was, guys, your job is to make lemonade from lemons. And the thing that I really respected about this group of people was, this town needs this project now more than ever. So our job, and like I said, every project has some degree of adversity, was to create things after the storm. We immediately set up a mill on site, we harvested all the lumber, we milled it, we reused it in the project, and we created destinations like this. And that became part of the process. The heronry, we have pelicans here. But there's a heronry on site, 11 species of migratory birds. I'm proud to say there are more birds nesting on this site than there were when we began the project. But what we wanted to do was expose that to the citizens. We wanted both things. We wanted people, the birds to be happy and to continue to nest, but we wanted people to be able to see and experience that. So we created these bird blinds along the edges of the bayou so people could actually see these nesting habitats. Um, as a consequence of the birds nesting, the pond became um, eutrophied. It was dead. There was so much um, excrement from the birds that the water needed to be filtered. So we incorporated biological filtration, and in a seven-day cycle, we filter the water and return it back to Ruby Lake. That became part of the educational experience for children. But all that being said, I mean, we really wanted to connect people to the site. The bayou became part of the visitor experience. You can take a pontoon boat ride and see a 1,200-year-old cypress tree. But again, those were the dreams of this particular project. You know a lot about us. I think there's a lot of applicable things that could be transferred here. But I think what the point that we wanted to make was we're not afraid or uh, to uh, dare to dream big. And I think there are opportunities here with this particular project to do that, to make it transformative. So, so your project. First thing we do is we go and we try to understand how it fits into the fabric of the city. When SWA works on a project, probably to a fault, we look big. We want to understand how it works in the region. We don't just look at the margins of it. And understanding what you already have in Baton Rouge that works and what doesn't work and how this complements or detracts from that, that's step one. Understanding, you know, just names of things, right? And where these names came from. How big are these uh, lakes? I like to go around and just take pictures. What is the place made out of, right? Lots of green stuff, lots of water, lots of signs telling you what to do, what not to do. 
I think this bridge is pretty cool, uh, the structure underneath it. We had to deal with that at uh, Buffalo Bayou. Maybe there's something to it. Uh, really interesting, people that live along the margins have gone out and kind of co-opted pieces of it, right? There's people that have, they keep a little canoe there. They have a little tiny boardwalk, you know, they kind of walk out. This guy has created this bird sanctuary and the guy next door to him has created, looks like a French garden. It's amazing. Uh, really wonderful that people are going out and taking advantage of these things. But it's mainly about the people, right? The people that we interview and we talk to as we go out on site. So how big is the uh, lakes? It's about as, you know, compared to Central Park or New Orleans City Park. For those of you that really only think in football terms, uh, it's about 26 Tiger Stadiums. <laughs> uh, other things, so we look at a lake, right? It's like that lake's got problems. Well, it's a bigger problem, right? So this is a diagram that shows the size of the lake versus the size of the watershed, right? So all the water that falls here ends up in that lake. Water that falls here ends up in that lake. It just means that we need to think globally. We need to think bigger about what the solution is. We can't just go in and dredge the lake and be done. We have to do other things within the watershed of each lake to keep it maintained so it continues to, uh, to minimize these kinds of things that are happening, right? We know all the metrics. We've read all the reports. Matt's the expert at digging into all these numbers. Uh, but this is stuff that the real things that we have to work with and our engineers and our scientists that are on our team, they dig into this stuff. And I think what's important about our scientists is that they help us give form. They're not just guys that sit there with numbers and crunch numbers with calculators. They figure out what those numbers mean and how to actually shape a lake or create a place around that. This is a project we had, that we did where we, same problem you guys have, too much phosphorus. We reduced it by 97% in a lake project that we were doing uh, in Houston recently. Same thing with nitrogen, reduced it by 85%. These are two big problems you guys have. We know how to fix those problems and we've, we've done it before. Uh, how big is it, you know, 7.8 miles around it. One and a half miles in length, right? If we connected those lakes together, it's big enough for LSU to actually have an Olympic class rowing team. We can't do it right now because the lake's not big enough. We just think differently about it for a minute. Uh, traffic things, we go around and look at speeds of how fast do people go. We look at, you know, what happens if you get hit at different speeds. We need people to drive slow so that if you do get hit, you will live, right? Uh, and then there's just things about, you know, implied ownership. You know, these areas feel like the residential people own them. Other places feel like the campus owns it. Other places feel very public. What does that mean to a design solution? It means something, right? And that's the sort of stuff that we want to dig into and understand. Views are extremely important to the residents that live here, to the people that come out and use it. We can't forget about that, and that's gonna drive everything I think that we do. So excavation, let's move some dirt. We got 815 cubic yards of dredge that we have to deal with. Uh, you know, there's gonna be equipment like that that's out doing this sort of stuff. If we put these trucks all together, we could drive it all up to Fayetteville, right? That's how long of a, of a tractor or trailer of trucks we're gonna have stretched together. So, We'll let the Razorbacks deal with it. Uh, you could fill Tiger Stadium and still have that much, have a lot left over. That's about 650,000 cubic yards. A lot of stuff. You could build a lake that big, I mean not a lake, an island that big in the middle of the lake. We could make it shaped like a tiger if we wanted to. I don't know if we want to do that, but we could. In Dubai they did a palm island. In Toronto they're doing a uh, maple leaf. You could make a lot of little islands. You could make 100 foot wide band all the way around all of the lakes. Uh, you could do little eco islands and things, right? We don't know what the solution is, but we need to work with you guys to figure it out. How much of each kind, right? That's, that's really the question before us. So the new reality, where are we going with this? You know, we're trying to get to this healthy city. Uh, this is a book that we wrote basically for how to deal with uh, creating ecological uh, healthy ponds. This is for Harris County Flood Control. But basically all the biology that goes into making one work. So if you take the existing condition that we have right now, Shallow lake, uh, runoff from homes and businesses and everything around, goes right into the lake pretty easily, conflicts with pedestrians. At a, at a minimum, we think we need to do this. We need to capture water, treat it, we need to make shallow and deep aquatic habitat. And if you do that, there's certain types of cultural and social opp opportunities that would be supported by that. If you wanted to go all the way, you actually start to build some islands. We need to think very cautiously where that would happen, if it happens at all. But you could do that. You could start to actually say, look, let's do some overstory habitat. Maybe you let little pieces of that, uh, that old cypress swamp return. Uh, you could do that. And if you do these sorts of things, it gives you these other opportunities, other cultural opportunities that you can start to do, right? So nature supports culture and society. Little design ideas that we've thrown around, you know, hey, there's a, a great big public park here. 
there's a very unresolved kind of public space along this edge. Maybe that becomes sort of a promenade. It's a more formal kind of park, right? Everything right now is kind of the same along the edges. Might be interesting to think differently about a little piece of it. Uh, gateways, there's these places where there's, you know, roads kind of go over. If we were to connect the lakes, for example, or even if you don't, you could come in and start to think about iconic bridges as maybe a way that you create um, view sheds or add to the views or create new ways to, uh, um, to appreciate the, the lakes. So a lot of things with suspension bridges that are being done, things with art, you know, are just very classic, simple gateways. All those things are on the table. So ideas. This is the kind of stuff that, you know, these projects, we get excited about them. We start thinking, what are the opportunities? And we do these sort of projects uh, around the country. So we see what other cities are doing. So what I want to caution everybody with is that this is not a design uh, idea. What this is are questions. What do we want to do? So let me get this to go forward. There we go. All right. So question, what is this place? What is this? Is it a city wetland? Is that the idea of what this thing needs to be? I don't know. Maybe. Is it a town lake? Can we make the water clean enough so you could swim in it? Does it become like Austin's town lake? You probably could do that if you spent the money in the right ways. Okay. Uh, I'm getting the yellow card. It's just like World Cup soccer. Uh, is it a uh, postcard place? It already is that. Maybe it wants to maintain that. Education, of course, is huge, extremely important. Lakeside paths, of course. I love the idea of maybe a porch swing grove that sits out there and people can come out and hang out and do different sort of things. Kids today, like all of their playgrounds are so hermetically sealed and perfect, they can't get hurt, right? Uh, I love the idea of trying to do more adventure play for kids and for adults as well, right? Places that people can go out, blow off steam, get healthy, do different types of things. Uh, there's that little beach thing. Uh, <laughs> can we do a real beach? I think we could, right? And if we did a real beach, you know, I don't know. Some people find this, oh, this is scary, but let's do bonfires on it if we're going to do it, right? I want to make s'mores, maybe. We can have floating platforms. You could rent one and have a uh, revenue source for sort of funding all of this, and we can have parties out there. Of course, burgers. Of course, we want living lakes. I love the idea that as the lakes get more uh, uh, get more strong, the fish get bigger, we can have fishing tournaments, and you know, you can have world-class fishermen come out, and people want to go and watch them fish. Again, maybe another revenue source. Dragon boating, that can be a blast. Things for little kids to go out and do. How far do we go with this, right? How much is too much? Should there be coffee? Should there be lunch? Should there be cocktails? Should I be able to get dinner there? This is a city that loves to eat. I can't eat on this precious, precious jewel of water here. Stump thing. I invented this for you guys. This is, uh, when they're doing the excavation, they're going to hit a bunch of stumps out there. We need to figure out what that means and what we can do with it. Paddle boards. But we don't want this, right? I don't want to confuse anyone thinking we need to do all of these things. That is not the idea. The idea is to figure out what's the right approach. So we're going to come back if you guys like what we have to say. Even if you don't like what we have to say, that's okay too, because ultimately it's your choice to decide what happens here and what doesn't happen here. This is our basic planning for workshops. Workshop one, we're going to ask everybody what they want. We're going to poll it. We're going to keep track of it. We're going to go out and canvas people that are walking around that maybe don't come to the events. We're going to map it out like this so you can see exactly what people liked and what they did not like, right, if we can show them at the next meeting. Step two, earth to ecology. We're going to come out and say, how much dredge do we have to deal with, and what do you guys want to do with it? Everyone will have their map, their dredge. They'll figure out what they want to do with it. It'll be a blast. We'll have ecologists that will be help us make this work so everybody understands how to build ecology, what to do with the dredge. If you guys decide to send it to Fayetteville, then we'll do it. Uh, build your own parks. So after we know where the dredge goes, are we making a Mike the Tiger shaped island? I don't know. Uh, then we're going to have build our own park, right? We'll show up with all of these sort of ideas of different kinds of programs that might be there. Let people argue and fuss and fight and try to negotiate what is the right thing. Everything they come up with, we'll sort of photograph and we'll keep that uh, document it, and then this will form the basis of master plan alternatives. We'll probably do two, three, four, depending on what comes out of the things before. So we'll show those. Everybody will kind of decide what they like, what they don't like. Usually they start to get merged together. You don't usually just pick one. And at the end, we'll unveil the master plan, but most importantly, show that that master plan goes back to that very first workshop and all the things that happened before that and really ties back to it. So what kind of things might this place look like? We made postcards. Right? Uh, where are my postcards? Here they are. As you're leaving, you're going to be able to grab postcards because there are people out there with them. Uh, and they have a little comment spot on the back. If you want, you can write in to us and say, hey, I really like that thing. 
I want that Mike the Tiger Island, or that was the craziest thing I've ever seen, don't do it. Uh, but these are the kind of places, right? These are not designs, these are just ideas, but the kind of places that we think there may be a place for. So trail circuit, this kayak angling idea, maybe it's like the crazy dude on the, the, uh, the uh, paddle board. People do yoga on paddle boards now. I, I can't do that, but anyway, they do it. Uh, I love the idea of this, you know, May Street Bridge, right? Let's build a real bridge there. Let's connect the lakes. People and the crew guys can row underneath it. And we can close it certain days, and we can have parties on the bridge, or you can rent it for a wedding. I don't know, but it's like another revenue source, just an iconic thing that's really special, authentic, and unique to Baton Rouge. This is the idea of kind of this more formal promenade. Maybe there's some place that's a bit more like that. Um, place that I can actually go and get something to eat on the lake. Do I have the Boathouse Cafe? Maybe. Uh, I think it'd be interesting, but again, revenue sources, that always helps us then to figure out next time that big money needs to be spent, we kind of have that all covered. And I think most importantly, ecology, right? People back here that, you know, maybe they're students from LSU that are learning about uh, the lakes, they're learning about aquatic ecosystems, they could come out and study them. Right now, what people are studying is how bad the lakes are, they're studying the pollution in it, they're studying the not enough dissolved oxygen, they're studying phosphorus. What I want to have happen is people come out and study what's so great about it, how many aquatic invertebrates there are, how many biggest fish, I'm done, red card. And I think, oh, that's, that's the end. Did you want to say well, some I mean, beautiful well, thing two things. Uh, one, I mean, with done. the postcards, consider it almost the first workshop. We'd love to hear your comments. We're going to pass them out at the doors, write it in, and send it to us. But if there's one thing we wanted to drive home, I mean, for those of us who have elected to stay and practice and work in Louisiana, this is a pivotal moment. We never thought that we'd probably have opportunities to work on projects like this, potentially, that have the magnitude of this. I, I, we're all Louisianians. Most of us in here are Baton Rougeans. I think we're longing for something to be able to point to with pride, in addition to the other things that we have here. And this, in our opinion, is that opportunity. We want to be able to take visitors to places and show it off and say, look at what we've done here to transform our city. And I think this is truly that opportunity. Um, I've asked our Alexandria and Baton Rouge staffs to come. I'd like for them to stand up and, and indicate to you our commitment to this project. Um, it, it is something that, that for us is a lifetime, uh, potentially a, a lifetime experience. So with that, we thank you for your time. We appreciate the, the, the fact that you did shortlist us, and um, we're happy to answer your questions. Yeah, I think you guys have a few questions for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to move into Q&A. Gentlemen, thank you, and thank the team for your interest in this project. <clears throat> we very much appreciate you being here. Just a couple of questions we have about the relationship. Um, how will you ensure collaboration and management of the project from two different offices that are both co-leading this work? Have you all worked together? And we have two principals in charge, designers from two different firms. Who, at the end of the day, is the lead designer? At the end of the day, I'm the guy that you will call if it's not going well. And I'm the guy you'll call that says, this is wonderful. So that's, it's me. Uh, SWA is the lead. We will be, I'm design director for the project. Uh, the way that we, we collaborate constantly across offices, we collaborate constantly with different firms uh, around the country, around the world. Uh, I have staff that's on the phone collaborating with consultants in China just about every night. So collaborating with a guy that's four hours down the road will be a joy will be so easy. Uh, but we talk a lot. Uh, that's how things get done. We email. There's all the sort of standard things that everybody does today. Uh, the, the way we're kind of dividing the work up uh, conceptually is that SWA is dealing with design direction, uh, planning, urban design issues. Jeff's dealing with landscape architecture. He's dealing with the local aspects of all the things that are going on. I'm trying to deal with bringing in national expertise, ideas of things that are happening uh, around the world, across the country. Well, if I could add that, I mean, this isn't sort of the first time we will have collaborated with other firms. The project that I referenced in Orange, we were lead with another firm. Um, we actually orchestrated 25 consultants on that particular project, administered all of them, because migratory bird specialists, um, um, aquatic plant specialists. I mean, I am not afraid to defer to somebody 
who is an expert at something um, or a subset specialty. Um, so we are used to collaborating, and I'm, I'm more convinced now more than ever that that's how you get the best product. So I think it's a healthy balance between this worldly view and local knowledge and the pulse of the community. So I think that's what we really want to convey to you guys. With that said, sort of dovetailing on that question, uh, Dennis Blunt from BRAF, I'm sorry. Um, who will lead um, the public engagement seg segment and, and how often will they be in Baton Rouge for, for meetings? So you're going to get one of these, which outlines our public engagement strategy in a little bit more clarity. Uh, there's basically, and again, we're going to work with you to figure this out, but at this point we're saying there needs to be at least five of those, which we kind of outlined in the, the event or in the show. Uh, I will lead all of those. Uh, Jeff, of course, is going to participate as well. Uh, as there's things that we need to do to kind of set up to make sure that they happen and that all the kind of behind the back of house things that need to get set up beforehand. Jeff's here day to day to make sure that that gets done. You can meet with him as much as you want. Uh, I'll come here probably at least every six weeks. You know, an example of a project we did in Atlanta, I had people call me, or our client there, call me regularly. Hey, there's a, a guy that is thinking about fu helping fund this project. Can you come meet with him? Yes, I can get in the plane and I can be there in two hours. Absolutely, let's do this. Uh, and that's the way that we work. We want to be extremely uh, available to you. Uh, as we kind of put together the work plan, I mean, I think a lot of that is going to be questions we're going to ask you guys. How often do you want to meet? We have clients like in Fort Wayne where they want to stretch the project out because they want to be sure that they get a lot of public engagement. We have projects in Houston where they want it really short because they're just trying to get this thing built really quick. So I think that's the, the questions that we need to work with you guys to figure out is how often, how much is too much or how much is too little. Uh, but I think we're very, very flexible on that. Well, if I could add thing, if I heard the question correctly, I think the answer is that both of us will be at every public meeting um, and that, that our Absolutely. office will orchestrate a lot of the day-to-day -day in planning and, prep and preparing for those. Um, uh, the project in Orange, Texas segued into a $7 million riverfront park that we just finished. Uh, the mayor called me every day. You know, I pride myself on being accessible. Um, so, and I think that's what it takes. Big ideas and communication is a key. But I think the real answer is that both of us will be at all the public meetings and our staff will help orchestrate those in advance. Yeah, I, I should say, you know, one thing, you know, it, I, I have this thing on my business card that says President SWA, which suggests that, is that guy like he's the marketing guy or something? Or he just kind of, I don't know, steps back and runs things from afar and pulls puppet strings? No, I, I work on projects. I'm required to be billable. I have to do projects. And I only, because I'm president, I get to pick the ones that I'm most interested in. And I get to direct the resources. I grab the best guys from my office and make sure that they are on this project. Uh, it's a big deal for us, and we will be accessible. I will be there. Kyle Graham with the Coast Protection Restoration Authority. You, you've outlined um, a lot of opportunities along the lake, as well as um, some of the challenges. Um, in, your, in your review of everything that's going on here, what, what stick out as some of the, or the main challenge um, to being successful here on the lakes? You know, the, the biggest challenge is it's the same on every project like this, is that there are very different user groups. There's very different demographics. There are very different uh, income levels of people that use this place. They're just, there's, it's, it's fraught with tension. It's not even clear who owns it in, in, in the minds of most people, right? I mean, who owns these lakes, right? Uh, so trying to understand those issues and kind of chart them out so that there are places for everyone. There, there's just conflicts inherent. I mean, if you drive along um, uh, you know, the residential streets that, that abut it, you know, I mean, Breck has come out and done their best to try to you know, keep cars from parking um, in those, those places in front of people's homes, right? So is that a park because it's got Breck garbage cans and things like that? Or is it private? You know, it's this very quasi kind of thing. That's going to be the most important thing that we're going to have to figure out how to deal with, is how to get, understand what the residents need uh, and require, because this project will not be a success without their full engagement and without them really wanting to be a part of it. But at the same time, people that are using it for other purposes, uh, guys that just want to go jogging. It seems like it's you know, a lot of students. Uh, there's people from other neighborhoods that come. They, they, uh, they want to do exercising as well. 
Uh, there's people that want to go out in boats and paddle around. There's people fishing. Uh, so it's just it's trying to figure out how all these different user groups will come together. And I think trying to solve the hydrology and all that stuff, it's science, it's numbers, that's easy. Uh, working with the people is the hard part. And if I could add one thing, I think, you know, um, and I've sort of indicated this to our staff, I said, for example, as it relates to the residential component, think of it as if you live in one of the houses on Lakeshore Drive. What would work for you in your mind? What would be successful for the project as a whole? And what's doable? What's palatable you know, in front of this residential area? So I think you know, that, that would be a pro an approach that we would take on, on lots of things as we began to do the analysis. Because I think there's so many diverse uses and so many diverse abutments as to you know, the extent of the lake. So I think um, those are observations that, that we try to intimate within our staff is, is role reversal. What if you know you jogged this every day, or what if you lived on on, on the lake? So I but think we, those are important. Yeah, but we need to be sure too that we actually are designing for this whole cross section of people that live in Baton Rouge and call it home, right? Because it's they it can't just be you know a one size fits all thing. I mean, it, it does divide out nicely. There are areas that feel they feel very public, right? Uh, you know, even areas over here. Uh, and then there's areas that feel very different, right? We just need to understand that, and it's going to come through talking with people. Uh, Brian, <coughs> Brian Harmon, Public Works. Uh, you had a nice little picture of the stumps. I'm sorry? You had a nice stumps? picture yeah. of the stumps. Right. Uh, so obviously you put a little bit of thought into it. Mm -hmm. How do you actually propose to address those? To, to deal with the excavation? How I would do it, and we've talked about it a fair amount, uh, and Biohabitats are um, one of our sub-consultants. They deal with it constantly. Uh, you know, I know it's not probably the most popular idea. My, my father thinks it's a horrible idea, but it's, we need to drain the lakes. We need to use amphibious excavators, and we need to go in and just do it right, like that. Now, you could do a cofferdam that went, say, halfway down the lake here or halfway this way, so you could, you could do half and half. You could do it in thirds or quarters. There's lots of different techniques that we could come up with like that. But I think just doing it right is going to take an excavator, because what happened the last go-round the dredge can't deal with stumps, right? They just, they're not designed to hit stumps. So that slowed it down. That kind of, it was extremely costly. It went over budget. It went over schedule. I think if we just say, look, let's do this thing once and let's do it right. And it's, the other thing is maybe it's a huge learning opportunity for the public, for students, for people that are studying hydrology at, at the university to be able to come out and actually understand how we're dredging it, how we're going to shape it. There needs to be places, I think the report says five feet deep. I think there's places that need to be 15 feet deep. And there's places that need to be 18 inches deep, right? I mean, it's, it's about habitat, which is about ecotones, which is about variety. So that's how I would do it. Um, but again, it's maybe not up to me. <laughs> but. Uh, Danny Mahaffey, LSU. How would you engage the LSU community right next door to get them excited about this project? And how would you integrate them into this? So it's a huge education opportunity. Uh, and w one of our little postcards, you know, there's some ladies in, uh, you know, in, in uh, waders, you know, and there's a piece of uh, equipment out here. They're sampling oxygen, trying to figure out what's going on with the lakes. Uh, I mean, that's, that's the easy one, right? Let's get people out there so that as this process happens, they learn about how to create an aquatic ecosystem that's actually robust and is not going to fail 5, 10, 30 years later, something that's going to last a long time. Uh, I think that, that's a huge piece of it, so just the educational aspect. I think by draining it, uh, or at least doing pieces, it's going to look horrible, at least pieces of it at a, as we go through it. But again, huge educational opportunity. And I think even bringing students out from the elementary schools that surround it, from the junior highs that are around it, that's a huge opportunity as well. But then there's also just the resources of smart people that are educators there. You know, Van Cox is here. You know, I'm, he, he's worked on this project and you know, thought about this thing for years and years. I mean, I'm, he's one of the first people I'm going to want to talk to about when he went through it 30 years ago, kind of what were his observations. Uh, you know, the ornithology apart, department, hydrology, all those guys, I, we need to embrace them and bring them into it. We need to, I mean, they're stakeholders, I think, in this because they know more about it than I do. And I need to, you know, I need to be the sponge that kind of sucks up that knowledge. If I could add something, I think the way to excite the students is to show them these possibilities expand their horizons about the what ifs. That will engage them and I think encourage them to come to these sessions and, 
at participate in the process so that they could kind of see what the possibilities are. And if I could concur with what um, Kinder had to say, I mean, this is a tremendous education um, venue. The process could be just that in itself. It, it would be a, a giant archaeology lesson or, you know, a science lesson. And I mean, from, from elementary school age children all the way through the university. And I think that we need to sort of couch the process once this project sort of takes legs to encourage people to participate in the process and kind of learn from it as it's being implemented. Yes, Carolyn McKnight from Breck, and I was wondering, as you talked about the challenges connected to this project, how would you build the political support and the funding, the necessary funding support into this planning process to make sure that we can implement this plan? So, you know, the funding's always complicated, right? You, what you got this year, you cannot get next year. If I got $40 million from one you know, bond measure or from a government agency, it's gone. You got to start over again next year. It's just, it's just always this new thing. So we do have a, a consultant on our team who's going to help us with that. And they, they've worked in Louisiana. They understand the basic <coughs> landscape. But I think just uh, things that we do at SWA, uh, you know, we've helped uh, people set up 501c3 uh, corporations so that there actually is a funding mechanism that can take in this money, nonprofit. Uh, and they can go out and fundraise in a very different way, and in a very deliberate way, right? And so I, th I think that's probably one of the first steps, is to set that up. Everything we do right now is public-private partnership. Every, you know, Buffalo Bayou looks like a public park. The mayor came out, she loved it, she took all the credit for it. You know, she had a very small part. The, the city government had a small part in that. We found that money through dealing with donors, foundations, just sitting with them, talking with them, giving them presentations like this so they understood how that one little thing is gonna become this much bigger thing. Uh, but I think that's, that's a big part of it, uh, is just kind of building that support. The other thing which I'm interested in is just like the early win. What is the thing that we could go out and do tomorrow for not much money that people see, hey, there's a little success there, there's a bigger success, a bigger success. That, that's how we've gotten big projects to happen is through those little successes just growing. And I can't say, but I mean, I really agree with what the statement that he just made. It's all about momentum. First, a master plan that's excitable but doable. I mean, one of the mayors comes to me often and says, Jeff, I love all the great ideas, but I really like the doable ones. And, and then picking from that those first key projects to excite people. And once people want to be associated with winners, and when they see something that's been successful and exciting, that everybody wants to jump on board and that gives the project momentum to want to do more. The project in East Texas, I mean, that propelled the Riverfront Park that we just finished last year. You know, $8 million for a town of 18,000 people was a big deal, but it wouldn't have happened had we not done the other project, so. Louisiana is home to a vast amount of species and pit stop for millions of migratory birds. Uh, how can we improve the habitat around the lakes and what are some opportunities for strengthening the flora and fauna? So, you know, my, my thing I keep going back to is, um, I should say Kevin Shanley, my partner, uh, who's, uh, he's actually, he's not here today because he's had to deal with some family issues, but he, uh, I, I like to call him the lake whisperer. Because uh, what, what Kevin does, and he does it with Bayou's too, is you know, he, he looks at them and he tries to figure out you know, that place, and what is it, uh, he listens to it. Uh, but it's asking like, you know, what do you want to be, LSU Lakes, Baton Rouge Lakes, what, you know, what, what is it? Because uh, I think that's, that's a, it's a unique thing about this. I mean, this was crafted out of a very natural place into a thing that's still looks like nature, but let's face it, it's not really nature. It takes a lot of management for, that, for this thing to work the way it works. Um, but so asking it what it wants to be, I mean, I, you know, to me the things that just jump out of my, in my mind is, man, what, what if we just left it alone and the whole thing became a swamp again and Tupelo Cypress stuff started growing, right? Um, I'm sure if you live there in a home next to you, you're like, that guy's crazy, we're not doing that. Uh, so like, you know, that, that's that thing of trying to figure out what people want, we can't just ask the lake what it wants. We have to ask the residents and the citizens what they want. Um, but that, I think that's a big part of it. I do think that there needs to be more habitat, but some of that habitat is stuff that happens below 
the surface of the water. A lot of it does. Deep habitat, aquatic shelves, wetland benches. Uh, I think we're going to have to deal with this dredge. And so the question is, does that dredge become land, dry land, that becomes a bigger park system that Breck then is going to work through to kind of figure out what that park is and how to maintain it and how to operate it? Um, or is it something that's actually more you know, in the water? You know, it's, it's, is it a series of little islands? Is it a series of little ribbons that have wetlands, shelves? Do some of those actually have um, trees that start to grow on them, depending on where you put them? I mean, if you think about the areas like, you know, I mean, this edge over here, or even some of that edge, maybe along here, but there are zones where you could start to put islands that sort of became more like what was there before it was cleared, right? Um, that's going to be a huge thing for uh, habitat creation. Um, it's going to uh, also create different kinds of opportunities. So, like, Going out in a canoe right now, it's, it's a little bit boring, right? It's just big, empty, flat water. I mean, if there were islands, if there were some trees, if there were some wetlands, there was some shade in some places, you know, you kind of want to canoe out to that island. Maybe you want to get out of your canoe and have a picnic, right? Paddleboard around the thing. It becomes a canoe trail. Uh, so I think always pairing that nature thing with the cultural thing seems important. Um, but, you know, those are just some ideas that we've tossed around in the office. I mean, we start drawing and trying to design places as soon as we hear about the project um, because we're just interested in them. Is your Lake Whisperer still with you? Is he part of the proposed team? The la yes, the Lake Whisperer. No, he, is, he will absolutely be here. Uh, we think he'll be able to travel within two months or something like that. Um, it's not a problem with him. It's his wife. Uh, just going through a thing. But, uh, but no, he's dedicated to this project. This is the kind of thing that he lives for, you know, uh, geofluvial morphology and what's the other one, Matt? Uh, you know, hyper eutrophication, uh, all this sort of stuff turns him on. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but he'll be here, absolutely. Talk to me about the interstate bridge the interaction of traffic around Dalrymple, Stanford. Yep. What do we do about noise? What do we do about the both air, water, noise pollution? Um, the conflict between people and bicycles and walking paths, and how do we make this, you know, a, a real a sense of place that is different? When you arrive there, you know it, and yet we have all of these obstacles to getting there. No, it's full of obstacles. Um, and Jeff, you know some of this stuff um, in, in more detail than I do. I, I mean, I, I will say that, you know, in that kind of sitting down and sketching, you know, one idea comes, or if these are questions, you know, should, should the residential roads, should they be one way? You know, that, that's an instant way to kind of reduce certain types of conflicts. If you live there, you may think that's not a good idea, but these are, these are questions that we ask. Um, or you may think it's a good idea because it would cut down on traffic. Uh, you know, I think about, you know, I, I always wish that I could get uh, um, eastbound uh, I-10 at Dalrymple, right? If I could do that, then May Street doesn't have all this traffic of people just constantly going through it, you know, at rush hour. It's a little tiny neighborhood street. I used to do it when I went to LSU. Uh, there's um, traffic calming things that we need to think about. But the other big move is, uh, is just looking at how do we take dredge? Do we make these little ribbon islands that can hold a boardwalk? And the boardwalk doesn't have to be made out of board. It could be concrete. There's all kinds of different technologies that we might use. But if you start to think about how to move things where there's the biggest conflict, say along Stanford, move them into the water, make a much more interesting running, riding, jogging, cultural experience, I think. Uh, but Jeff, you may have some more detailed observations. Well, I mean, uh, we stood under that bridge and drove, drove around it, and the, you know, and what we really realized was that the noise was from the cars hitting the expansion joints over the bridge. It's the loud thumping. You really can't differentiate um, automobile from truck sound. So we're like, well, is there a solution for that? But but, but if one thing I can tell you, the first project we did in a third year, year design lab at LSU was the Dalrymple Gateway into the campus, and I think that that those that are traveling from the west primarily see that sign that says LSU and if they've never been to Baton Rouge and not familiar with the campus, oh, let's go check it out. That's what they're going to take. We need to hit them right in the, in the face with, wow, what an incredible place. And when I take that exit now, that road just seems kind of tenuous along the edge there. 
I mean, you know, and, and that's where you really begin to realize that we need to differentiate or separate pedestrian and bicycle circulation from automobile traffic. And, and in lots of situations, there's a sort of a bluff or a high edge between the roads and the water level. And it's kind of eroded and it's six to eight feet. But to me, the real answer to lots of this is how do you use the dredge in the right place to make it look like God did it and we didn't. And you use that for what would be pedestrian and bicycle circulation. Because right now, the roads, accidents getting ready to happen. And I really think a gateway along Dalrymple, I personally think it ought to be a vastly a landscape solution where you drive, you're driving through, you get off that interstate, and you go, oh my God, this is the most beautiful natural environment I've ever seen. And I think there is a possibility for us to, to, to do that. Um, and I think, again, a, a way to creatively use the dredge to differentiate and separate these, these conflicts between pedestrians and, um, and runners and bicyclists and, and cars, which, you know, in some places there are no sidewalks. In some places where there are sidewalks, they're right up against the back of a, of a, of a curb that, that a car could run up on. Yeah, little rolled curbs. They're just rolled curbs, particularly in front of sorority rows. So, you know, it's because there was no land mass. So I think that there are lots of opportunities. The other thing, the other opportunity is just traffic calming. So putting dredge and the lakes aside, there's just simple traffic calming techniques, right? So like if we have the right kind of pedestrian scale light poles, for example, and, and vehicular poles, and they're at such a frequency, and they're kind of close to the road, you just naturally drive slower. You feel like you're going faster, right, as there's sort of more stuff there. So you add that little bit of you know, friction kind of to the, to the road edge, that changes things. You can do it with vegetation, of course, with how trees are planted. Um, I, mean, I, I think we would definitely look at that. I like the idea that from a streetscape perspective that we kind of create this lake district so that there is some level of continuity as you drive around it in sort of how pedestrian infrastructure is handled, how the, the road is designed. Like right now it's, you know, it's mainly asphalt. Should there be like a little granite curb or a granite band uh, that's right flush with the asphalt and then behind that is like a decomposed granite pathway? Um, there's, I think there's lots of opportunities for just how to upgrade it. It would still be very natural, very South Louisiana in feel, uh, but I think that that's, that kind of placemaking of this being a district and using the street to do it is a pretty interesting idea. We are out of time. Darn. Uh, that's what I said. We're just yes. getting started. Come on. Uh, on behalf of our community and the foundation and our partners, thank all of you.